If you're to ask any child what they want to be when they grow up, the answer will almost exclusively be that they want to have a job, a role, or a position in society that will have impact and and be a great contribution to society. For instance, kids often say, I want to be a doctor. I want to rescue people's lives. Or I want to be a a firefighter. I want to rescue people from dangerous situations. Or I want to be a police officer. I want to to keep people safe. Or I want to be an astronaut. I want to go discover things for the greater good of humanity. There's these grandiose desire to have massive impact because we all have the innate desire in our life for our life to matter for what we do in these few short years we have on this earth to matter. All of us, it's a universal human experience. We desire to have a great contribution to the world around us. But as we get older, that desire to contribute something great often gets distorted into a desire to be viewed as great. Today, we're going to continue our series in the book of Mark. And Jesus' disciples are struggling with this very thing, that they, their, their desire to contribute something great has been distorted, and they want people to view them as great, as people of prestige and power and authority. And Jesus, they've seen over the last couple of, over, uh, last couple of chapters, the power of Jesus. Peter, James, and John saw the unveiled glory of Jesus. We talked about that two weeks ago as his radiance and brilliant shining light, like the sun that they saw on the mountain. And then when they descend the mountain, they see Jesus in his greatness over the powers of darkness. And now Jesus today is going to clarify for them what greatness truly looks like. The greatness truly looks like servanthood. So I'm going to be picking up in Mark chapter nine, starting in verse 30. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Now they're leaving the region of Caesarea Philippi. That's at the base of Mount Hermon, which is also called Mount Sinai. They're leaving that area, which is modern day Lebanon. And they're heading down towards south, towards the Sea of Galilee. Okay, this is a marked moment in the ministry of Jesus. This is the early part of his last year of ministry. And many commentators say this moment is when he begins his march towards Jerusalem, towards the cross. So they're leaving the area. They're headed down to the Sea of Galilee. And it says, and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And this is often kind of misunderstood. Why was Jesus so secretive, right? If you ever go to church, they're like, go tell people about Jesus, love people like Jesus, share the gospel about Jesus. So why was Jesus wanting to keep everything on the DL? Like, why is he so secretive about it? Because he says here, He didn't want anyone to know where he was going. And over and again, we've seen this in the book of Mark, where Jesus tells people, don't go tell others. And many commentators kind of make a guess. And there's this idea called the messianic secret. That Jesus did not fully unveil who he was to the masses at large because there was a misconception about what the Messiah would come and do. The common conception in Jewish culture and thought of the day was that when the Messiah came, that it would mean victory for Israel and that the Messiah would throw off the oppressors of Israel. At this time in history, it was Rome. And so Jesus knew that if word got out about the glory that Peter, James, and John has seen and the power that has been exhibited, if it got got out broadly, that uh, people would have tried to shove him and thrust him into a position of military and political leadership that he did not come to fulfill. And so he tells them, keep it on the DL because he's not come to overthrow their oppressors. Look at what he says. He says, the son of man, which is one of his titles, a messianic title from the book of Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 and 14. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. This is why he came. Ultimately, one day, Jesus will be the son of man in dominion and power. But in order for that to be accomplished, he stayed the course on the plan that he, the father and the spirit had from eternity past to die. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. So as we come through this, uh, the last part of this chapter, I'm just going to pull some ideas out as we're walking through it. So the first one I want us to see is Jesus came to die. It's pretty simple. 
It's, it's over and over and over what he's told his disciples. He's gonna suffer, he's gonna die, and he will rise. Suffer, die, rise. Suffer, die, rise. He says it over and over again. And this is the whole purpose for which he came. Jesus came with one reason, to accomplish the work of salvation on our behalf, that we might be redeemed. And so he tells his disciples, I, I, the great one, Jesus, am going to give my life as a servant, even to the point of death. That's what true greatness looks like. Let's look at the passage again. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. We believe that the Bible is inspired and that every word on the page matters. Look at this word, delivered into the hands of men. What this means, the idea there is that this is, he's going to be handed over. Now think about who, they, who is there with him while they're walking down the road, leaving Caesarea Philippi, headed towards, this, towards Galilee. Judas. And he's there talking to them about how he will be delivered into the hands of men. Now, at this point, Satan has not entered Judas and, and we don't know where he was in processing betraying Jesus, but we know he hasn't made that decision fully yet. And Jesus knows I'm going to be delivered over to men who will ultimately kill him, kill me. They will kill him. The author of life died. Like, I know that this is kind of the bedrock of our faith and, and, it's, and it can become just trite theology, but this, this should be so sweet to us that the author of life willingly died on, in our place. The creator was killed by his creation. What humility, what love, what bravery and resilience. This is about a year out from the cross. Jesus knew this was coming and he didn't try to avoid it. He resiliently marched towards the cross for your redemption. That is beautiful love. But why did he have to die? You see, we've all got a massive problem, universal human problem called sin. And sin is your greatest problem. It is uh, greater than your marital issues or your parenting issues or your financial issues or your car issues or whatever. It's the biggest problem facing humanity, sin. And here's why. Because sin is the only thing that separates us from God. Sin's the only thing that separates us from God. And so Jesus came down to the earth on a mission he didn't come here uh, on like vacation to check out the human experience, okay? Like put some skin on and say, what is this place like? This is an awful place to vacation. Lots of brokenness and sin here. He came here on mission. Jesus was a man of mission. He bled mission and he did it for us. He came to die and he willingly did so. Uh, theolo the late theologian and pastor Tim Keller shares it this way. He says, the gospel is that Jesus Christ came to earth, lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. That Jesus came and he lived perfectly. Perfectly. Which he didn't sin. He always walked in obedience to the Father, always keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, never broken the law, never lied, cheated, stole, hated, lusted. Jesus lived perfectly before God and before men. And at about 30 years old, he died on a cross. And it wasn't just the, the physical pain and torture that killed him. There was a spiritual reality that was happening here that on the cross, Jesus took our sin upon himself. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And he took our, his, our sin upon himself and God the Father poured out his wrath on Jesus. And I think the idea of wrath is often very confused and people think, well, well, somebody who's wrathful is just really peeved or, or somebody who's big mad. But wrath is so much deeper than that. It, cut, it cuts to the essence of who the father is. 
Wrath is God's holy, righteous, and just anger towards sin. God is a holy God, and he must punish sin. And on the cross, Jesus died the death. We should have died. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus and Jesus took every last drop of it and he died. And just before he died, he says, it is finished. This is that transactional language and that, that means your, your sin's debt has been paid in full, wiped clean in Christ. And in his death, we can find forgiveness of sins. And in his resurrection, he rose again three days later, as he said he would. We can find hope to live a new life. Jesus came to die for you. What's your response to that? Think about what this meant for the disciples. These are, these are, these are people who, it says they, they struggled with it. Let's go back to that verse. It says, but they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. Now it's easy to look at the disciples and say, come on, you bunch of buffoons, like get it together. He's told you over and over and over again that Jesus is gonna die and he'll rise again. But I don't think that's what's going on here. Is it not true that anytime we as human fleshly people hear death come into the picture, our hearts cry, no. In fact, this was not God's original plan. Death was not the original plan. But death came into the world through sin. And when we have, when death comes into the picture in our lives or we lose a loved one or, or maybe we get a prognosis that isn't very uh, good, our hearts cry, no. I don't think they're being idiots that can't get the point Jesus is teaching. I think when Jesus tells them over and over and over again, he's going to suffer and die and rise, their hearts are crying, no. And humanity has a keen ability to turn a blind eye to truth that we don't want to hear. Because they didn't just hear that their Messiah is going to die. They heard that their rabbi and their friend is going to die. As we were talking about this as a family, doing a family devotional in my home a couple of nights ago, my daughter, Audra, said, what do you think Matthew felt in this moment, hearing that Jesus is going to die? Matthew was hated by his own people until Jesus came along. And then finally, a Jewish man like him loved him despite his sin. And now Matthew hears that his friend, the one who's loved him unconditionally in the midst of his own depravity is going to die. This is devastating. And I don't think they're just, they're just idiots. I think they're really struggling with the reality that Jesus keeps bringing up this suffering and death. And I don't want to hear it anymore, Jesus. It's a hard truth. And so they're struggling with the reality that their friend, their rabbi, their Messiah, their Lord, will die. Continuing on in the passage, it says, and they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Now they're walking. Remember disciples like to walk right behind their rabbi. There was a saying of the day that they wanted to be covered in the dust of their rabbi because they wanted to be that close to his life. And so they're walking right behind him. So Jesus isn't asking this question because he's unaware of their conversation. He's not asking for information. He's giving an opportunity for confession, right? First of all, he's God, kind of knows everything. And second, he was right there with them. He's providing an opportunity for their sinful conversation to come to the surface and be dealt with. But look at their response. But they kept silent for on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Isn't it ironic? Peter, James, and John just saw Jesus' glory on the mountaintop. They saw the power of Jesus to overcome demonic forces at the base of the mountain. And Jesus just told them, here's what greatness looks like. It looks like the Son of Man, Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, who will lay down his life for many. And then they begin to argue about who's going to have the most prestige when Jesus' kingdom comes. They're thinking, man, he's got a kingdom. Maybe I'm going to be high up on the food chain. 
And he sat down and called the 12. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Here's what Jesus is saying. Greatness is servanthood. Greatness is servanthood. Let's look at it again in the passage. So they're arguing about who was the greatest. And the word in the original language for greatest is megas. Megas is where we get our word mega. Okay, megas. And megas has the connotation, one of the definitions of it, has the connotation that uh, you, you, you're desiring others to view you as great. This is not a conversation about the disciples are having about, you know, gosh, Jesus is so great. Look at how he loves people. He's got great character of a man. I want to be like him. They aren't talking about wanting to actually be transformed. They're talking about wanting others to view them as great. It's their own prideful desire for their egos to be boosted. And they're arguing about this megas. And he sat down and called the 12. Now in this, this, this verse or this sentence is rather lost on us because uh, we don't have cultural norms like this anymore. But when a rabbi sat down, it was an indication to the disciples, it's time to learn. This was a posture of unhurried wisdom. And so Jesus sits and all of the disciples know a teaching's about to take place, which is not how we, how we teach in, in, in our context anymore, right? I'm up here on a stage. A teacher stands at the front of a classroom or somebody at a conference stands in the middle of a stadium. It, it's not the posture with which we teach anymore culturally. But back then, this was an indicator. Jesus is going to teach us. Everybody sit down. All mouths would have silenced and all eyes would have trained right on Jesus as he begins to teach. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus says, greatness is servanthood. If you want to be first, you got to be last. The idea here in the original language for servant is the word there is diakonos, which is where we get our word deacon, which is an office in certain denominations of a church. It, most scholars also agree that it was probably an office in the early church by the time Romans is written. But here he says, we're called to be diakonos, servant of all. And one, one of the translations of diakonos that I love is the servant to a king. So contrasting their desire for greatness and prestige and pride, Jesus is saying, don't try and be the king. Be the one who serves the king. Serve all people in this way. Serve the least of these. He sat down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone would be first. Notice he doesn't rebuke their desire for greatness. He doesn't say, knock it off, that's a prideful pursuit. He reorients their understanding of what greatness truly is. It's not about power, authority, influence, holding all that over other people and being viewed as great. It's not megas. Greatness truly comes from serving others, from being the last. Greatness is servanthood. In 1898, the city of Bristol, England, came to a screeching halt with the news of the death of a man named George Meller. And George, uh, at, as he died, the news of his death went over, out over the city. Uh, 10,000 people showed up to his funeral. On the streets of Bristol, this is a picture. I know it's a bit grainy, but if you can see, there's just droves of people lining the streets as his casket is walked or carried by horse down the streets of Bristol. The reason for this is because George Meller was a man who loved the least of these. You see, he saw a problem in England that orphans were uncared for and often orphanages cost money for them to be a part of or to be cared in. And so most orphans either had to go into work at a very early age or suffer on the streets and try to fend for themselves. And he saw this problem, wanted to do something about it. So over the course of his life, George opened five orphanages that served over 10,000 children. 10,000 orphans. He opened or was a part of opening 117 schools across England. 
During his lifetime, he was given over $700,000 in today's currency to, to care for his own possessions and his own needs as he's ministering to the poor and the needy. And he said, how could I have $700,000 when they don't even have a, a meal before them for the next mealtime? And so he gave it away freely. Throughout the duration of his ministry, he raised over $129 million in today's currency that he freely gave away to the orphans, the poor, the needy, the widows in England. And much of that went to pay for the education of these orphans, pay for their tuition to go to school. He was actually single-handedly accused of elevating the, live, the lifestyle of the poor class in England by the high society. The high society didn't like that. He was elevating them up out of their stature by educating and caring for them. This was a man who loved the least of these. He didn't do this to gain notoriety and prestige or money. In fact, at the end of his life, he died broke because he gave his life away out of love for his savior and love for the least of these. This is what greatness is. This is what Jesus is talking about. Greatness looks like and is servanthood. Someone who waits on hand and foot for another person in love. And I don't think this is just a problem for the disciples. I don't think it's, you know, it's easy to look at the disciples and be like, gosh, you guys, can't you just get it together? You're a bunch of buffoons. You're all prideful, like just knock it off. But that, this pride, this ego issue isn't just a problem for the disciples. It's our problem as well. We struggle with the same exact thing, wanting others to view us as greater than themselves because it props us up. I know I struggle with it. To be honest with you, this week, I'm struggling with it. I didn't have much time to prepare this sermon. And about Monday night, I'm, my, my mind is spinning in anxiety. What am I going to teach? Oh no, this is a difficult passage. There's lots of different interpretations of it. It's kind of chunked out in a weird way. And I, my brain is spinning. I'm not getting sleep. I'm exhausted. And I did fruit to root on this just to get to the root of what is really going on? Why am I so anxious? And you know what it was? my prideful desire for you to like me, for you to think I'm great. It's megas. It's the same thing the disciples were struggling with. This is not just a, a silly little issue they struggled with. It's the issue we struggle with. Pride is the essence of sin. It's the reason Satan fell from heaven. It's the reason for the fall in the garden. We think we can be great like God. And I love this quote by George Meller. He says, a servant of God has but one master. It ill becomes the servant to seek to be rich and great and honored in that world where his Lord was poor and mean and despised. Why would we seek honor and glory and prestige in the world that hated our Lord? That just punched me in the gut as I was preparing for this message and myself realizing I've got pride. So where are you struggling to place yourself above others? Jesus says, if you want to be great, if you want to have great impact in this world, which we all, again, we all have an innate desire to do that. It looks like humble service. It looks like George Meller's life. It looks like the death of Jesus on the cross. Humble service, even to the point of deep sacrifice. So where have you placed yourself above your family or your spouse or your kids or, or your friends? And where might you, God be calling you to shift your perspective of what greatness is and begin to serve everyone like a diakonos, like a servant of the king? So Jesus is teaching his disciples and in the midst of this, he gives them a living illustration. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, before we get to the content of Jesus' message, I love this moment. It appears as though Jesus had children in and through his ministry. Like it doesn't say Jesus went outside and grabbed a child and then came back in. It appears that maybe mommy and daddy are sitting at the feet of Rabbi Jesus too and kids there, I don't know. But look at what it says, taking him in his arms. Jesus was such a loving and caring presence to children, which in the Roman society, they were looked at pretty lowly. 
like they're needy and they don't, they can't help you much. And, and so they were looked at with much, um, <coughs> excuse me. They were looked at as though they, they didn't have much value. And so he takes this child into his arms. Verse 37, he says, whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. He says, look, receiving a child who has needs and and can't provide for themselves is really what the kingdom is all about. Not about your prestige and your greatness and you're a position of authority, but serving even a child who has great Needs And that word there in the original language for receive, dekomai is what it is. And it means to receive someone as a visitor in your home that you're going to provide everything they need. Housing, food, water, whatever they need. You're the one providing it out of a hospitable heart. And so he says, he's continuing to make the point about what greatness is. It's serving even the least of these, even a little needy child. And in the midst of this conversation where Jesus is saying, you need to receive the even needy children and, and you need to serve others, John has a question. John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward speak evil of me. So here's the context. They see that they're, they're, they see another person <laughs> and many commentators believe this might've been one of the disciples of John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist said, hey, follow Jesus, he's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This guy left. He was just never called into the, the group of disciples with Jesus. And so he's been out there proclaiming Jesus and casting out demons. And the disciples see this and look at what the language says here. They tried to stop him because he was not following us. Well, Jesus never called anybody to follow us. He didn't say, hey, come follow me and Peter and James and John and Matthew. He said, follow me. And they are struggling at seeing somebody else do ministry in the name of Jesus because they're, he's not a part of the clique. And I don't want to over-spiritualize this because I know this isn't talking about church ministry specifically. But there is a principle here I want to point out. The disciples were doing ministry with Jesus and they saw someone outside of that ministry doing ministry in Jesus' name and bearing fruit. Demons were being cast out and they decided to stop them. It is very easy for us in ministry to think we've got it together and we're the clique and everybody else does it wrong. So they just need to stop it. That's what the disciples did here. And it's very easy for churches to do that as well. And to look at the churches around us as though they're the ones in the wrong because they do it differently than us. But if they're proclaiming the name of Jesus and there's fruit in their ministry that he's working powerfully in and through their ministry, who are we to stop them? And Jesus' definitive statement is don't. Like, just don't. Stop it. Don't. Because they, they won't speak evil of me. Or, or of my name. They're proclaiming my name. They're, they're doing good deeds. And he goes on, for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink and because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. He's saying, look, this person is casting out demons. They're going to be rewarded. Even somebody who gives a drink of water in the name of Christ has a heavenly reward. So Jesus says, don't stop them. And then Jesus comes back to the, the, the living illustration that's in the room, this little boy who's there on his lap. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Real comforting words there, <laughs> right? A great millstone. He says it'd be better for you to drown than to impact somebody negatively causing them to stumble and causing them to sin. What I want us to see in this part is you impact others. He's telling his disciples, you're focused on yourself. You're focused on your own greatness. You're pointing people to you, not me. You're going to cause people to stumble and sin. You impact others with your life. You are painting a picture of what Jesus looks like. So what picture are you painting? Let's look at it again in the passage. Whoever causes 
This is not accident. This may be accidental, but but he says causes. This is this is because of the life that they're living. Whoever causes, and then he goes on and says, one of these little ones, the word there in the original language is mikros. And mikros in the context here certainly can mean children, right? There's a child there with Jesus. But mikros in other places in the New Testament can also mean people who are of immature faith, who don't know better. Think about the context of what Jesus is saying here. They're in a private setting in Peter's mother-in-law's house and he's teaching his disciples who have chosen to follow him. And he says, look, if you cause someone to sin, and the word here the, for to sin uh, in the original language is where we get our word scandalized from. If you cause them to be scandalized, it's better for you if you drowned. Now, Jesus in this passage and in the rest of the passage we're going to be reading is speaking hyperbolically. Okay, we're not, he's not saying literally go tie a stone around your neck and drowned. He's speaking hyperbolically. He's using some extreme statements to make a point to his disciples that how they live their life matters. How we live before others matters. Parents, how we live before our children matters. That should be a very sobering thought. Jesus here says it matters deeply, so deeply that he uses this hyperbolic device that says, if we're showing a bad picture of Jesus and what following him looks like, it'd be better if we drowned. So what impact are you having on your children? We are the ones painting the primary picture of Jesus for them. And maybe you, maybe you don't have a family. Maybe you're single or you're in school or, or you still have impact. You have impact on your friends, on people in your life group, on your discipleship group, the people in your community, people you work with. You have influence everywhere you go, everyone you know. And if you claim the name of Jesus, what picture of him are you painting for the world around you? Jesus says this is worthy of serious evaluation. And he goes on with this kind of hyperbolic speaking. He says, it is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to the to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's not some fluffy verses, okay? That's hard teaching. But again, Jesus is using hyperbolic device to make a very stark and vivid point to the disciples. And here's what it is. Sin is serious. Sin is so serious, he says, that if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. Now, pause real quick. This is not the application of the message for this week. I don't want you to go home and be like, babe, we got to get the chainsaw out and start hacking limbs. Okay, that's not, he's using a hyperbolic device to make a point about how seriously sin needs to be taken in our lives. That we need to go to any lengths to eradicate sin. And I'm gonna be honest with you, the shepherd in me really wants to soften these verses, but I'm not going to because Jesus didn't. This is kind of a mic drop moment. If your, if, you, if your foot, hand, or eye causes you to sin, he says, cut it out. Vivid and visceral language to mean take your sin seriously. Sin is often trivialized and marginalized and, and, and managed and even in the life of Christians. And he says, it's deadly. It's like cancer. Get rid of it. Sin is is serious. Do you take your sin in your life seriously? And as I was processing this with my family, my wife had a great insight. She said, notice that Jesus tells us to identify first the source of the sin. What's causing it? Is it my hand, my foot, my eye? Is it my computer, my phone? It, what is it that's causing the source of the sin? And then what will you do to aggressively remove that from your life? We cannot do this alone. We can't manage our own sin. Jesus is pointing them to the reality that you can't handle this all on your own. 
that you in fact need somebody outside of yourself to rescue you from the seriousness of your sin, the sin that separates you from God, the only thing that separates you from God. So how do you view your sin? Do you explain it away or excuse it? Or do you, like Jesus says, take it very seriously, seek out the source of it and deny yourself that thing? As we come to a close today, there's a a grouping of two verses that are uh, a little bit uh, difficult to interpret. And you may have noticed in the passage we just read, if you're paying attention in your Bibles, that there are two verses actually missing in the ESV. Uh, The NKJV and the KJV have it in there, but many other modern translations don't. Verse 44 and verse 46 are removed from the scripture. And many people look at that and say, see, you can't trust the Bible. But as scholars have looked at the manuscript evidence that we have, almost all of the early manuscript evidence we have does not have verse 44 and verse 46 in it. And so scholars have removed those because they're not original to what Mark wrote. It was probably either a scribal error, or it may have been that a scribe was trying to clarify further what Mark was talking about. And here's what verse 44 and verse 46 both say. Exactly what verse 48 says where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, continuing to expound upon what hell is. And so those two were removed because it was not a part of the original manuscripts. All of the manuscript evidence that we have points to that direction. And so um, just I wanted to address that for anybody who noticed that. But these last two verses here, Um, are a bit difficult to interpret. They're actually some of the most difficult to understand what Jesus is actually talking about in all of his teachings in the gospel. Let's read them and then I'll tell you kind of two different interpretations here. Firstly, it says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt, if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now you may be reading this on the other side of the verses about hell and being great and be like, why is Jesus bringing up recipes? Like, what are we talking about salt for? <clears throat> and, and commentators and scholars are, you know, there's many interpretations of this. The two main ones is that when Jesus says everyone will be salted with fire, firstly, the idea that that fire, that salting, that seasoning is the Holy Spirit, that he seasons our life. And just like salt preserves and brings flavor to meat and foods, that we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring Uh, preservation and flavor to the world that's broken and dark. So that's one interpretation. The other is that the fire is like a refining fire as we go through persecution or suffering. Those are the two main interpretations here. And there's a lot of confusion on why Jesus ends his, this portion of his teaching that way. But what I want to come back to is that Jesus says, greatness is servanthood. Who is it that the Lord is calling you to serve in your home, in your workplace, wherever you live, work, and play? Who is it that the Lord is calling you to serve? I'm going to release to the campuses. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. And uh, as we kind of button up service today, I just want to give us a couple of things to process and think through, okay? As we've heard from the Word of God, now how do we apply? How do we live this out? Firstly, I want us all to just identify the sources of sin in our life. Let's level the playing field. We've all got sin. Now that's not an excuse to stay there, but it's true. We've all got sin. And so what are the sources of sin in your life? As Jesus says, if it's your hand, cut it off. If it's your foot, cut it off. If it's your eye, gouge it out. He's not saying literally go cut your body up, but he's saying take aggressive measures in identifying what that sin is. And then secondly, What will it take to aggressively remove those resources of sin? Maybe it means we got to cut off social media. Maybe it means that you've got to uh, cut off aspects of your life that you're used to living within. Will you, as Jesus commands, aggressively remove the sources of sin in your life? Have gracious curiosity for yourself not to shame yourself and and belittle yourself or condemn yourself because you're sinful. I'm sinful too. That's not what God wants is for us to be condemned, but he does want us to graciously evaluate 
where the sin is coming from and to aggressively remove it, to kill the sin. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray, God, as we evaluate sources of sin in our life, that you would help us to see where we need to transform and help us to live in light of your love and not feel shame as we evaluate. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Love you. Have a good Sunday.